Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low-budget show. It's the show that is so low, there's no budget. We are the opposite of the Snyder Cut, a very timely reference if you're listening to this in 2021. As of the day I'm recording this, the Snyder Cut was released. That is not, however, what we're going to be talking about in this video. I'm going to do a separate Snyder Cut video after this one. Don't know why. Because fuck my life is pretty much why. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to watch the Snyder Cut, but we're talking about Godzilla today, and in particular, we're talking about what makes Godzilla such a timeless classic. You know, it's a fun conversation. I figured we could kill a few minutes talking about it, because I, I'm a Godzilla fan. I like that character a lot. I like the world it builds up, and I want to kind of get into why do I think it holds up, and why is it revered by people to this day? But of course, before we do that, we do have a few pieces of news to talk about, because, you know... The world goes round, every day happens, and we try to keep things light and positive here, but not a lot of news this week. There's a few things I'm like, oh, should I talk about this? I guess I will. A lot of, uh, lot of stuff I don't normally talk about, but whatever. Starting with, wow. We talked about it before on this channel. I guess we're going to be talking about it again. The Powerpuff Girls have been cast for the CW reboot, extension, whatever you want to call it. Um... A lot of surprises in here. Dove Cameron. That's a surprise. I believe she's Bubbles. Chloe Bennett will be Blossom. Again, a surprise. And Yana Perel will be Buttercup. Is that the... I don't know. I don't remember which one's which, but... What a... What a weird choice! <laughs> like, if you were to tell me... Chloe Bennett <laughs> was going to be in a Powerpuff Girls reboot where she's an adult woman who was a hero when she was a toddler. I wouldn't believe you. But here we are in the world where we're having... This is happening. Guys, this is literally happening. This is the world we live in. Powerpuff Girls exists. It's being rebooted. Wh oh, man. Weird. I, I, I'm just like, we're doing this. Okay, that's great. Very. I guess I'm very excited to see what this could be. But I'm going to watch it because it's kind of fun, I guess. Just incredibly... Dove Cameron? Yana Perot? Like, these are some big names, and you got them for this Powerpuff Girls thing? Are they putting Superman and Lois money behind this? I really hope so, because that would just be the funniest thing in the world, is if this movie had the money of a Superman and Lois. I said movie, it's a TV show, but good cast, I guess. It's so weird. What a weird top. What a weird thing. Just a really good cast for a weird property. Speaking of good casts, we got confirmation that Annie Murphy, who you guys will probably know as one of the leads in Schitt's Creek, she'll be making her debut into Russian Doll Season 2. So I guess Russian Doll is still happening. It's been talked about for a long time. I really liked Russian Doll. It just had that a certain aesthetic and feeling that I liked a lot more than normal like things done in that comedy style and that trope. I love that first season. And Annie Murphy is so fun. She is so fun. I was waiting for her to get other work. Dan Levy, I get Dan Levy getting other work. That guy's going to go far. Eugene's got his thing. Catherine, she's got her thing. But Annie, I'm like, let's do it, babe. Let's go break some bank, man. This is really fun. So I'm probably going to cover Russian Doll on this channel. I don't know how extensively I'm going to cover it when that new show comes out, but I'm definitely going to be talking about it. I'm very excited about this news. I think it's very fun, very different than from a lot of people's like interpretation of what that show could be. I think it, uh, that's just really cool. I really like the idea of Annie Murphy coming here. That makes me really happy. I can't wait to see what that's going to be, how that's going to look. It just excites me to no end. Like, come on, that's just cool. That's just fun. She's a great actress. She's a young talent who's going to go far in this world. She deserves this chance. She deserves this opportunity. And now she's doing it, and that makes me very excited. So guess what, guys? In the same vein of things we kind of already knew were happening, there is more stuff that is going to be happening that we knew about. So a long time ago, there was some speculation about both of these being made for HBO Max or even just for DC at large, but Zatanna and Batgirl are going to be getting films that will stream exclusively on HBO Max. So I'm in support of this. I have been very vocal recently in saying you don't need to do everything for film. 
Like, you don't have to wait for theaters anymore. We are at this point in our lives, and it, and it sucks that COVID did this, but it was going to be coming whether or not COVID happened or not. This was always going to be inevitable that we don't have to go to a theater to get our big premiere movies. That was never the intention. That it's just the direction we were going. It's always been that route. It started with things like The Sopranos slowly showing us how good prestigious television could be. The bubble finally broke, I think, with WandaVision and The Mandalorian. This is the future. Zatanna and Batgirl, two great choices because we know that they both can hold their own. They are both strong enough to hold their own in a property, but maybe not in a film. Like, Zatanna is a great character when she's supported by the rest of the Justice League Dark characters and the magic users. I love Zatanna. I always thought she could hold her own in a movie. This works for me if it's going to connect to that weird, uh, what are they saying, like Riz Med themed Constantine movie. Do it, man go crazy with that i love this idea that this character is going to get her opportunity and batgirl is another intriguing one because i i could see this kind of going in the route that they're kind of going in with the comic books right now and that is it's not just going to be like barbara gordon it could be cassandra kane in there it could be stephanie brown we could be getting like a bunch of batgirls showing up in a movie having our own birds of prey kind of team i just remembered cassandra kane was in birds of prey weird that, uh, that was a weird choice. I like that movie. What a weird choice for Cassandra. Either way, it's cool. I like this. These are two properties I'm super excited are getting these moments, getting this opportunity. I hope it pans out. Next, we just need Booster and Beetle. Next, we need Green Arrow. Like, get these characters their moment in the spotlight because maybe a movie wouldn't be good. If, any, if, if Snyder's Justice League will prove anything, it's that people will pay money for your premium service if you're releasing good stuff. Yeah do it great idea i'm in support of this i love it i think it's going to be really cool to see what actually happens with these very fun stuff and that's all the news we have like there's not a lot but let's end things just kind of briefly talking about this i'm not going to go through every individual list i think i'll do like a recap after the event but we got our oscar nominations we got our people this year 2020 who have been nominated for an Oscar. A lot of great stuff. No surprises, really. Like, I don't think anybody here was like, oh, yeah, they didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve it. Every nominee works. Some obvious snubs, but that's just every year. I get it. Um, You know, Minari getting a bunch of nominations is great. Promising Young Woman getting nominations is great. Sound of Metal got a lot more than I think people were expecting. But I think it's, it's deserving. I love that Another Round got nominated for Best Director because I really liked that movie. It made me very happy to watch it. I smelled throughout the entirety of it. Very fun stuff. It's great. I actually don't have any major complaints about any of the nominations. I think everybody who was nominated was deserving, was able to be nominated. Like, it, it, it makes sense to me. You know, like, I'm not like, oh, do we really have to nominate Borat? I know it was a big movie last year, but... Was Borat the one I'm kind of like, really, best adapted screenplay? Really? Whatever. It worked for the most part. I don't have anything bad to say about that. Like, it, they're great nominations. Chloe Zhao is just going to knock it out of the park. I love that she's she's going to win it. She's going to sweep. You guys just wait and see. Chloe Zhao is going to sweep, and she's going to take home everything. I can see Mank picking up a few awards. I don't know who's going to win the actor category, so that's the thing. Like, I could see it being... Would you think they'd do Steve Ewan? I think they could go Steve Ewan this year for actor. But for actress, is it, is it going to be Carrie Mulligan? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. There's so many good choices. I'm going to say Carrie Mulligan until I'm proven otherwise. That is where I'm going with that. But we'll see what happens. I'm very excited. Like, these are all deserving movies. I don't feel bad for anybody that was nominated. Like, you didn't deserve it. They all deserved it. They're all really great pieces. I think that's really fun. So let's take a quick break, and when we come back, let's jump into our main topic, talking about the King of the Monsters, or the Queen of the Monsters, depending on how you look at things, Gojira, Gojira, I should say. Don't know why I said Gojira. Whatever. Goo Goo Gaga, break time. Oh, boy. Godzilla. We're getting another Godzilla movie. Godzilla vs. Kong will be coming out next week at the time of this release. Man, that looks good. I'm very excited to see more Godzilla in my life. I was thinking, should I talk about King Kong? And I think we'll come back to do a King Kong version of this at a later date because I love King Kong almost as much as I love Godzilla. Like, I go back and forth on which one of those characters I like more. 
I think King Kong's got a way better legacy here in America. I say America, I'm, I mean like North America, because, you know, over overseas where I'm from, Godzilla has like a big cultural phenomenon. That character is just huge over there. But when I think about Godzilla, I'm just like, it's amazing. It's really amazing how this character has lasted as long as it has in popular culture. Because you look at some of the things that are like it, you know, there isn't really any major monsters, at least in North America, that has lasted this long. I think overseas in like Japan, where, where Godzilla's from, there's that the culture is just a little more like geared towards that in terms of like their popular culture and their myths and stuff. Like Godzilla is a big character over there. Like the franchise is huge. They've been they've been making movies constantly over there for a long time. Everything about that is perfectly good over there. But the thing to me is that when you come to North America, we really just like Godzilla. Like, Ultraman doesn't stick over here. You know, Gundam doesn't stick over here. There's people that like it over here. But the one that broke the mold was Godzilla. You know, we have King Kong. You, I guess you could say Pacific Rim, kind of, but that's very new. And Transformers is just like a toy, so I don't really count Transformers. We'll talk about toys in another video. But I think for some reason, there's like only one of them that broke through completely. And that was Godzilla. So it got me thinking, what are some of the like big appealing factors of the character of Godzilla? Because I think you could you could analyze this character as being like an al allegory for like man's hubris, which I, I could definitely understand. That's like the conception of the character from the beginning. You know, he, Godzilla is from an era when we were doing like the nuclear testing and the atom bomb and all that stuff and things were going bad all over the place. So it would stand to reason that when we see the world potentially being destroyed that we would see our own hubris come to us in a form of a giant creature that's going to destroy the world. That's likely. Not unlikely, but you know, you guys get what I'm saying. Like Godzilla, it's very unlikely, but come on. It makes sense that this is where we'd go in terms of our storytelling. Like, this kind of creature would exist in that way. And that's, I think maybe that's something I like about the character. And maybe that's why it kind of stands the test of time as long as it has. Is because it's a universal story that can work for any era. You know, like in the 50s when Godzilla debuted, even to like 2014 when we had that last movie. You just see, like, the arrogance of man is what creates Godzilla. Like, our nuclear testing, this lizard, this creature feeds on it, and it powers itself up, and it comes to destroy us in a, just like in a fit of nothingness. It just comes to fight us for no reason, which is kind of like a really good example of giving more depth to your story. Because when you do, like, a monster movie or, you know, like a slasher flick or anything like this, I'm going in the general, like, you have an opposing force going against your character. Things like Freddy Krueger, things like Godzilla, things like Jaws. You want to have that personal connection to it. And I like the idea that the personal connection for Godzilla is that we messed up. The humanity is the reason this creature is coming for us. This is what we are at fault for. It's staring us straight in the face and it's coming to kill us and break us in this sense. That is a pretty interesting thing to see. You know, it's not something we were used to seeing at the time in the 50s where it's just like our monster flicks, they're created by man pretty much because, you know, hubris was a big thing back then. But it's like at this scale, it never really had like that intensity to it. And I, I think that's pretty cool. So that I think that's something that maybe more like the analytical side of people could interpret as one of the things that makes Godzilla really cool. Obviously, another one is the design. And I, this kind of goes into my other point I wanted to make where it's like the design is so timeless because it can be updated and changed and still you know exactly who that is like it's kind of dinosaur meets lizard like it's not straight up dinosaur it's not straight up lizard those are two things that a lot of people like dinosaurs are awesome like who hates a dinosaur dinosaurs are the coolest I love dinosaurs, and lizards are cool too. They're freaky and weird, and you mix them together, you get something like this. It's pretty cool, and that kind of was like, yeah, it can look campy, it can look serious, it can look silly, it can look tough. That's kind of like how I always thought that Godzilla was a great interpretation and a great understanding that you can do things in different genres. You can have your principal character, and you could do those dark and intense things, like 
You know, there's something very versatile about that where you can become something different than what you were initially intended to be. So the initial conception of Godzilla, it's a horror flick. It's a monster flick. A creature is coming down to destroy us. Well, then let's branch off and make it kid friendly. We got like young kids here that are interested in seeing a giant monster. We're going to make it a little more playful, a little more interesting. You got your devout fans who want to see it hardcore and destructive. You got darker, more brooding, serious pieces. You got your over the top campy pieces. You have built lore around your so much so that now you can do like the emotionally satisfying pieces and get like resolution for the character that's pretty cool like how many other franchises about slashers or monsters or creatures like that really like can bounce around a different genre and have it work they all try to bounce around in genre to get like a new audience and captivate people but to have it work like if you look back on a lot of those earlier Godzilla movies they can get pretty silly and that's not a bad thing. That's not me, like, razzing on them in the slightest. I love campy stuff. I also love campy stuff when it takes itself seriously and doesn't try to lean into the camp. Because that is something where it's like, we know it's silly. We're all watching this like, that's a guy in a rubber suit. But in the world, that's Godzilla. That's Jet Jaguar. That is Mothra. They're fighting each other. We have to believe that's what's happening. Or else it, the whole illusion's broken and the movie means nothing. I think we can just like stare at Godzilla in that time period and be like, oh yeah, I get it. That's great. We can see it more evolving with the times like, okay, we're getting darker. We're getting seriouser. Then we come into like the 2010s and we see everything just like we have to make a franchise. We're making a character. We're making a story. It's not just camp anymore. It's serious. It's lighthearted. It's real. You guys understand it. You understand the motivations behind the character. You understand everything about the character in there. And it's very cool to see. I really like that idea. You know, it's like the design is flawless. You, you understand right away the stubby arms, the scales on the back, the kind of like lizard-like mouth and the, the long tail. You understand right away that is Godzilla. There is nothing else that looks like it in like film or in comics it is straight up godzilla anything else that tries to look like it is homaging godzilla that is pretty cool like i really like that idea because it's just so fun it's so fun the character itself is so fun and that's also what makes it timeless like you can go back and watch any of those old movies you're like these are silly but they're cool like you're sitting there and you're like this guy's cool I could watch this again, even for the camp factor. Some people might take it a little more seriously, and that works too. I think the legacy of Godzilla is just something that we should endure and write more about. So, obviously, the earlier stuff is all Toho. I think that's very like apparent and something we should hold near and dear to our hearts because how cool is it that a thing from Japan has crossed over and, and like maintained itself in like the American popular culture? Obviously, we've seen it before. But it's more just like, you know, like robots and anime and weird shit. But Godzilla is nothing like those. Godzilla is just the creepiest thing in the world. And it's just so cool that it's maintained its staying power. I love it so much. Like, it's just really nice to see that this is where we can go. Like, we can actually have a character like this last as long as it did. Because it's a universal story, like I said. Like, there's literally just... Any time period in the world, you can make your Godzilla story. People will understand it. People aren't going to freak out about it. They're going to understand this is Godzilla. This is where we are in the world. Isn't that cool? I think it's very fun. And of course, it appeals to young people. Like, it's a giant lizard that breathes fire, breathes lasers. It's just creepy and fun. I love it a lot. It's, it's just one of those things. Like, like, with like Buzz Lightyear or with like Indiana Jones, kids love it. Adults love it you get it. It's really cool. So I I just I, I I just always am amazed that we can have a Godzilla movie in our lifetime because I think it's amazing that a character with a few hiccups here and there because every every year there's a couple hiccups with that but pretty much like throughout 1954 till 2021 we've been consistently getting a Godzilla thing. Some of they're all different, some of them are better than others. Some of them are real weird. Sometimes in the 90s, we try to do things that don't work. But we still are consistently doing our thing with Godzilla. And that's really cool to see. So I do want to take a moment here. I do want to kind of bring this up too, because I was thinking, should I do this in another video? 
Or should I talk about it here? I want to talk about the idea of the kaiju for a bit. And the kaiju is like the big monster, the big creature that kind of like permeates throughout popular culture. It started with King Kong, of course. But I think Godzilla has kind of become bigger than King Kong. Because the thing of Godzilla, I think more so than Kong, is we can have him as the hero or the villain. Like Kong is straight up the hero. He's the good guy through and through. He gets taken by his people. They, they, they enslave him. He breaks free. He's the hero. But Godzilla, sometimes he can be the villain. You want mindless destruction for a big creature? There's your creature. Godzilla, you want somebody to stop the threat that's coming to kill us? There's Godzilla to do it. I like the idea of kaiju. And in particular, I like the idea of the Toho kaiju. You know, there's just so many cool characters in the Godzilla mythos, which is kind of exciting to see. Like, we've, we've made so many of these films that we can actually have, like, a bunch of different characters that are equally as cool and powerful as Godzilla, and they're very fun to see. So I wanted to talk about a couple of my favorite ones before we kind of, like, continue on with the Godzilla stuff. So I am a huge fan of Mothra. I've always liked that character. Now, I'm, I'm somebody, if you meet me in real life, you'll know there's two things I don't like in this world. I'm not a fan of birds. I, I, can't, I cannot handle birds, and I can't handle moths. They just freak me out. But for some reason, I always found Mothra to be the most charming and elegant creature in all of the Toho legacy. I just really enjoy that character. I really love seeing what it is. I, like it's so unique it's just like a big moth it's so fun it's so angelic at times it looks great it's kind of like the truest hero in a, a form of some of the sense but of course it's like fought godzilla and stuff i just like the way that character has always just existed it just has such a distinctive look and i just really like that look it makes me really happy when i see it you know and i, I can't believe i'm saying that about a bug because i i'm not a big insect guy <laughs> so just having mothra be that character I think it's really cool. I think it's next to Godzilla. It's like the coolest one in that era of like the Toho stuff. Another one I really like is Gigan or Gigan, if, however you want to pronounce it. I think if you're going for a badass look, Gigan is probably the coolest one out there. It just looks like a cyberpunk Godzilla with like hook hands and bigger spikes and radical looking everything. It's so cool. A fun character design. That's the thing about this legacy too, is like these designs, these characters, they are so fun and interesting. There's like nothing, there's nothing like them in the world. Like everything is homaging them. Everything is trying to be like them. They just look so cool and different. I really like it. I really like the way that one looks. I think it's very fun. Another one I really like is Rodan because it's just a big dinosaur. And dinosaurs are cool. People really like dinosaurs, man. They're really fun and engaging. And like Rodan, it's just a cool, a cool concept. Like all of these are just really fun. I could just like, I'm looking at the list right now and I'm just like, these are all great. Like, come on. Ghidorah's awesome. Like, I don't even know. Like, should I even go through all of them? You know, they're awesome. Destroy us. Cool. They're just really fun. I really like Godzilla. And I like what that world is. I like what it's setting up. I think it's a very fun story. Everything about it is very engaging and cool. It's fun that we live in a world where another generation can just experience this stuff because Kong versus Godzilla is obviously a big deal to a lot of people. And that's exciting. Like We live in an era where we have a bunch of these things and they're all very fun and very cool. I'm just rambling again. I think this is going to be a very short one just because my, my notes on this, they weren't very extensive. I'm just like, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's cool. You guys know it. Like the legacy of Godzilla, like the, the reason Godzilla is a timeless classic is because it can be anything to anybody. You can watch those old movies and you could be like, it's campy, it's cheap, it doesn't hold up, but I'm enjoying myself. Or you can watch those old movies and you can be like, this is intense and cool and fun. It sparked an entire generation of filmmakers and storytellers and creators who just like seeing that stuff. That is really powerful. That is so fun and such a great thing to say about a creative experience is that you can just sit back and watch it absorb over you and have a great time with it. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty fun just to have that kind of experience and that kind of reaction to a bunch of stuff like this. I really enjoy that. So yeah, of course, Godzilla is a timeless classic. There is nothing else like it in the world. 
We never had something get that big and that monumental as that concept. We are seeing man's hubris come into the form of a giant creature to destroy us. Not a foreign concept, but one we have seen plenty of times before. And when we are seeing it here, it's scarier and more intense. There's a great lore behind it. We see the death and resurrection of the character. And there's like children and versions from space and fire and aliens and all this destructive stuff. Yet, at the core of everything, it's just a giant lizard that breathes fire. What's not to love? How could you hate that? It's really fun. It's a really cool character and a really interesting concept that probably gets more respect in a certain community than it does in other ones. But, if, like I said, if Kong versus Godzilla has shown us anything, it's that even in today's climate, people still get excited for these characters, for this world, and I like seeing that. It makes me so happy to see that people are very interested in what this has to be. I enjoy that a lot. So, I'm going to end things there. Like I said, it's a short video, but I just wanted to put this out in time for Godzilla vs. Kong because it's important that you guys get some backstory. Not even backstory, but just like, I wanted to get my words out there on it. It's not a long video. I am sorry again. We'll, we'll be back talking about the Snyder Cut in a longer video, I promise you. But this, I want to end things with a couple of recommendations. And the recommendations for this week are are obviously going to be Godzilla related. First off, watch Godzilla from 1954. It still holds up. It's still good. It's very fun. Watch Godzilla from 2014. Like, it's going to give you some backstory for the character and everything that's very cool. Watch Godzilla versus Space Godzilla. Like, that one, to me, is, it's just silly. It's just silly and fun, and you're going to enjoy it. And I can't recommend Shin Godzilla enough for 2016. It's such a great, timeless piece that I think is going to move a lot of people in a way that you weren't expecting. It just had some really great stuff in there. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. So those are my recommendations for you when it comes to Godzilla. And of course, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Geek Wave. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to this on the podcast feed, please give us a rating over there. It certainly helps out the channel. As always, you guys can check me out on Instagram, Patreon, Twitter, and soon to be OnlyFans. And I will catch you guys in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.